show in October. Um, so I appreciate you turning out. Um, I will say I may get a little antsy. I tend to pace a lot uh, and wave my hands around. So sitting in a chair is a little bit challenging. Um, so if you see me twitching, that's why. Uh, let me get to our next slide here. Uh, so I want to actually start in 1675 in Albany, uh, where there's a group of Mohicans that travels uh, through, and they're speaking to English officials and explaining that before they were strong of people and had power, but now they are weak and are but few. And so they're asking at this moment for permission to plant on Dutch soil, which seems to indicate somewhere that Europeans are living more than Indians, um, because their earth is very empty. So I think they're pointing to really two contrasts in this particular moment. One is between their impoverished environment and the apparently more attractive lands inhabited by European colonists. And the other is between their thriving past and their present, where they're sort of signaling that there is a diminished condition, referring either to their individual bodies uh, or to the numerical and political strength of their communities. And I think those are actually connected to each other. So here we get this moment where Mohicans are really associating these two major threads of the Hudson Valley Indian experience across the 17th century. They're linking changing environmental conditions to the political ascendance of European settlers. And they clearly understand that something about the Hudson Valley's environmental relations had changed that affects their situation and their prospects. And that's kind of my agenda today is to start thinking some about how European colonization really affected the physical conditions of the Hudson Valley and its landscape, and by extension, the individual bodies and the human communities that relied on it, and how that in turn contributes to these developing colonial relations between European colonists and native inhabitants. So hopefully I've got something of a new or sort of unique story to tell here, um, asking us to think about these connections. And part of what I'm grappling with or thinking about uh, is what a group of New York historians, New uh, Netherlands historians in 2014, referred to as entangled histories, where they're really trying to sort of tease out some of the complexities and connections. Think about the colonies or the region's relationship to other colonies, like in New England or in Brazil, uh, to think about their relationship between the different inhabitants as well. And one suggestion was that environmental history could be a really promising method or avenue to, for treating that. And it seems fairly logical if you think about this, if you are sort of foregrounding the environment the physical setting and telling its story, it helps you integrate the stories of all of these different people who are living there. There's multiple cultures and communities that are negotiating over the use of resources, they're positioning themselves in space, they're experiencing weather and climate uh, and the effects of those things. And so narrating that history of the physical environment is an attempt to really recast the landscape. You don't have a stable background. The environment is constantly changing, and those changes reflect and also influence the way that humans are acting and behaving in that historical moment. So as far as the sources that we can use to do this, I'm really relying on kind of a mix. Um, it'll be much more clear when I'm talking about the documentary record and these narrative accounts. There's Dutch uh, accounts, there's English accounts, and sometimes these are people who are somewhat indifferent to sort of cultural variation. You get lots of generalities, uh, but they're still useful. They're not necessarily always carefully documenting environmental change or environmental factors either. Um, there are lots of comments when they find something remarkable. And so it's sometimes hard to figure out whether this is something unusual or something common that you should treat as a pattern. But there is that documentary record. And we'll see some of that. There's certainly the archaeological record as well. One of the challenges with, I think, the archaeological record in the areas that I'm particularly interested in is they tend to be in locations that are prone to disruption. There's lots of flooding. There's lots of development over the course of multiple centuries. And what we see in the archaeological record, I think, at least the archaeology that I've read, uh, is that sometimes it's those more upland sites um, it, at higher elevations that early on are more specialized. And later on, they become the sort of permanent inhabitations of native peoples. And so I think I don't have as much uh, data or information about uh, what I think are the more permanent locations. And we'll talk about where those are as one of the main topics here. We've also got some proxy sources for thinking about environmental change. One is dendrochronology. 
tree rings. This is great. There's some really great studies that will track uh, tree rings and use them to figure out approximate precipitation and temperature patterns in parts of North America, as well as give some indication of when there's major fires, which tend to be periodic. Uh, so that's the kind of information we get there. And then finally, there's sediment and soil cores, often taken from wetlands. And so this is sediment layers, and we can sort of track over time how the air quality has changed. In this case, you get a lot of attention to pollen, which tells us something about the vegetation that's surrounding these areas. So all of those sources I'll briefly touch on as we move along here. As far as where I'm headed, I want to start out thinking about the native Hudson Valley and its environment, how it's actually operating for native peoples. I want to talk about natives starting to integrate the Dutch because they can fit the Dutch in fairly easily. But of course, Dutch settlers are also modifying the landscape for their purposes, as are English settlers who follow them or sometimes accompany them. From there, I want to think about what the environmental impacts of those activities are and how that matters for the interactions between people. And that'll sort of let us conclude thinking about English assessments and the later part of the 17th century um, as they're coming to occupy that territory. It's kind of my, my broad overview here. So it seems like humans are arriving in the Hudson Valley, uh, at least that region, maybe 12,000 or so years ago. Uh, at this point, you do have ice caps, you have glaciation, and so the coastline is actually about 100 miles further out uh, than it is now. About 10,000 years ago, as you get warming temperatures, glaciers are starting to retreat. People are moving up into the wetlands and uplands that that leaves behind, right? They are sort of following up in these channels, canyons, and rivers um, into these warmer environments. And so you get this long period where there's sort of sporadic interaction sometimes. Um, people are there, they're gone, or there's not as much evidence of them. It's a lower population. That population really starts to accelerate, though, about 1,500 years ago. And at the same time, we see some evidence of early horticulture. Maize seems to be domesticated right around then. We also see evidence of intensifying use of marine resources, especially fishing. You get these deposits of fish bones and implements for fishing. Um, and then we get more evidence of maize and the bow and arrow about 1100 to 1000 years ago, which again is really compounding this population growth. All of that means that by around 1600, you get an estimate, and it varies. I mean, the population numbers are always hard to figure out uh, in terms of who's counting and how they're doing it and the sort of methodologies for figuring out population densities based on subsistence patterns. But probably uh, the last number I saw that seems fairly convincing is about 15,000 people uh, in 30 to 40 autonomous communities spread between Manhattan and what's now Albany. Um, and here you've got a couple of different groups to think about. One is on Long Island, or one region is on Long Island, where there's probably, the estimate is about 6,000 people living in 13 different bands. But there is kind of a division where the eastern end of Long Island is inhabited by Algonquians, who are more associated with some of those peoples who live in New England across the Sound. The western end, those folks seem to be more associated with Muncie uh, on the Hudson River. And so then we can sort of start tracing this up the Hudson River, where there's 20 to 25 or so Muncie bands communities that comprise probably 4,500 to about 5,000 people up to Dutchess and Ulster counties. And it's not entirely clear where the sort of division is. It seems kind of blurry. Um, and people certainly interact across this cultural divide as we move further north with Mohegan and Catskill Indians. And here I saw a really wide range of population estimates. Um, as I think most of the figures settle around 2,000 to 3,000, but I've seen as high as 5,300 to 6,500. And sometimes it seems like um, people are, when they're counting these numbers, actually moving over and counting into New England where you have related peoples as well. Um, so like I said, it's always hard based on how people are defining the geography here uh, to figure out those numbers, but roughly 15,000 and 30 to 40 different communities. <clears throat> thinking a little bit about how all of these people are supporting themselves, I want to move into thinking about their modes of inhabitation. And in particular, I want to frame this as uh, different modes of energy use, which are being uh, 
used to really support these sizable communities uh, and a human population. So thinking about the types of resources that are available is really important. There is a combination of uh, subsistence strategies that I think come into operation here. Lots of times these native groups seem to be operating from a permanent base, but really using mobility as a tool to access different resources and different uh, forms of energy. And so when the Dutch use this term river Indians, uh, which the English are going to pick up on later as well, it's kind of accidentally insightful. It generalizes, right? It doesn't distinguish between the people who belong to different communities. It doesn't make divisions between Muncie and Mohican, but it does foreground the centrality of the river for all of these groups of people. And I think we can see a little bit of the importance of the river in these two quotes that I got up here for I guess the river's in one. Um, Adrian Vanderdonk says, who you saw on the earlier slide, says that you seldom, they seldom abandon their secure castles and large settlements completely, but otherwise they easily pack up and move on. And Daniel Denton is English. He comes along a few years later um, well, in the 1670s. Vanderdonk, I think, is 1640s, 1650s. Um, and Denton says they build small movable tents, which they remove two or three times a year, having their principal quarters where they plant their corn, their hunting quarters, and their fishing quarters. So if we're combining these two quotes, we can sort of get a sense that there's seasonal movement that's really based around a permanent uh, settlement, right? There is sort of an orbit around a central point. And Indians really are strategically locating those permanent inhabitations at the nexus of different environments and some of the channels that connect them. So they, these are sites that are very carefully selected. Often that means on riverbanks where the Hudson River estuary intersects with either coastal marine zones or major freshwater tributaries, these larger streams. These are sites that are often already energy rich. There's lots of biological resources. There's lots of plant life. There's lots of uh, animals that are grazing on that plant life. There are marine resources at this spot. These are also spots that are constantly resupplied by energy streams that deliver resources, energy, and nutrients from somewhere else. They're also, finally, the third feature of these sites that they're selecting, um, these are sites that have access to transportation corridors that will enable Indians to actually travel abroad and reach more distant energy reserves, things that they're not constantly exploiting, uh, but that sort of build up an energy reserve that they can then use strategically during certain times of the year. As far as where we're actually talking about, a lot of times this means rivering bottomlands, um, so these sort of flat areas near major waterways. This is important in part because regular flooding helps to redistribute alluvium, uh, sedimentation, and erosion from upstream areas, and that helps to replenish the soils. This is essentially bringing energy to native agricultural lands in the form of nutrients that humans can't consume, right? People aren't going out and eat, eating the dirt, but plants then convert those nutrients into energy that's usable, usable and accessible to people. Um, that's particularly the case after the 14th century when the Three Sisters Agricultural Complex is sort of figured out. Here you've got maize, you have beans, and you have squash. And so these cultivars can provide a fairly reliable source for native agriculturalists who are on these bottomlands. There's also a lot of edible wild plants that grow here, um, both in drier soils as well as in some of these wetlands or marshes. You have berries, you have nuts, you have tubers and roots, lots of soft tissue plants. Um, and they especially thrive in disturbed soils. So they sort of colonize and invade these recently deposited uh, topsoils that are accumulating in these bottomlands. And those edible plants do a couple of things. One, of course, they provide a food source for native people, but they also feed, uh, they feed birds, they feed mammals, right? And so they support game populations as well. These sites are also often at the confluences of major waterways. Uh, the Hudson River as an estuary intersects with a number of freshwater streams. That means that you get a wide range of fish species. Some of them are resident and some of them are migratory species. Um, Nicholas Van Wassener in 1624 says that the Indians live in summer mostly on fish. The men repair to the river and catch a great quantity in a short time as it is full and furnishes various sorts. 
And so between March and May, you really get successive waves of spawning fish. There's smelt, there's alewives, there's shad, there's blueback herring, there's striped bass, there's Atlantic sturgeon, and they're all coming at slightly different times depending on water temperatures. Then in the early summer, a lot of the species that reside permanently in the estuary start migrating up into the freshwater tributaries, and these are spawning runs. Uh, there's several more migrations in the fall as well. This means that there's constantly this sort of replenishment. So if you have a lot of men who are harvesting fish, it's not like you're going to deplete that population because the next population is moving into that region that you inhabit at this particular moment. There's also oyster beds, mussels, clams, scallops, crabs, and in coastal areas, access to whales, dolphins, and seals. And so all of this then constitutes really significant energy stores in these species that inhabit year round but there's also migratory fish, which are effectively importing energy that they're gathering at sea or in the estuary and delivering those to these native fishermen who are often fishing near their agricultural villages as well. A third component of these sites is that they often are accessible to uplands. Uh, this sort of is this idea of what's called verticality. We talk about verticality more often when we talk about the Pacific coast of South America, where you get a really rapid elevation change and the resources are very different as you tear up the mountains there. This is much less dramatic in the Hudson Valley, obviously, but it is relevant. You do have resident game animals, certainly um, for hunting uh, near these permanent sites but they're less important given the abundance of some of these other foods. You also have aquatic resources uh, provided by wetlands and waterways that attract migratory waterfowl. And the Hudson Valley runs north-south. This is a migratory flyway for swans, geese, and ducks. And Adrian Vanderdonk comments on this, as do some other colonists. So sort of like fish migrations, these birds are bringing uh, seasonal imports of energy, especially because they come in the spring and the fall. The spring there's often food shortages during the spring because it's after the winter, crops haven't yet matured. Um, so really important in that sense. Final, the final component of this hunting uh, regime then is those upland areas. If natives are really concentrated along these major waterways, that means they're not moving to higher elevations and hunting there constantly. They certainly do access that sometimes uh, during the summer, spring, summer, and fall. More often, they're traveling there in the fall and winter to hunt deer, moose, bear, other large mammals. These are areas that tend to be less biologically rich, but they're undisturbed most of the year, which lets them build up these really healthy game populations as sort of a reservoir. And so then Indians are traveling to access it and divert that back to their permanent homes during the time of year where these uh, permanent locations alongside major waterways are much less productive and certainly agricultural lands aren't actually producing. And the final piece of this, well, not the final piece, another piece of this um, is that natives are developing these storage methods. They certainly dry meat and corn. Um, they're smoking it as well and then storing it in storage pits, which are cool. They limit exposure to air and they protect food stores from animals. And so natives aren't just living hand to mouth, right? They are definitely planning, they're building up a surplus, they're storing it uh, and strategizing how they're going to consume it. And this is really a strategy of stabilizing energy supplies during seasonal fluctuations. If we're talking about migrations, if we're talking about plant life, that's all somewhat unpredictable and prone to disruption. Here you've got a surplus and sort of a reserve to tap into for these native communities. Daniel Denton shows up and this is pretty typical of a lot of colonists, assesses the situation and says how prodigal, if I may say so, hath nature been to furnish the country with all sorts of wild beasts and fowl. And so he's attributing all of this abundance to natural abundance. He sees all of these resources that natives are consuming that uh, Dutch colonists are able to access and assumes this all exists without human intervention. He's really dismissing the degree to which natives are strategically settling and positioning themselves. He's dismissing some of the activities involved in extracting resources from various locales, going to these different environments and exploiting them. But he's also overlooking the human man management that enhances the diversity of that environment itself. And there's two major strategies I wanna add on here. One is the use of fire, um, which Vanderdonk comments on, a number of others comment on as well. Vanderdonk says the Indians are in the habit once a year in the fall to burn the woods, plains, and those marshlands that are not too wet. 
And so fire can operate as a tool. It accelerates the decay of some of this, um, some plant life and leaves and returns nutrients to the soil. It helps to maintain a sort of meadows and grasslands where there's herbaceous plants, some of them edible, some of them uh, serving as forage for game animals as well. Um, and so that is a really important tool that natives are using. I also think, though, that disuse is a tool, is a strategic management uh, tool that they're employing. They're strategically neglecting certain parts of their larger regional environment to help cultivate resources. So that, that uh, use of upland hunting grounds only in the fall and winter is one example of this. They sort of leave it alone to replenish itself during the rest of the year, and they don't then have to actively cultivate it. It just regenerates. Um, so that's one example. Another example is relocating towns and farmlands. Um, that is, of course, to take advantage of the greater fertility in different places. Um, but it also leaves behind these disrupted areas where people have been inhabiting and using them fairly intensively for a while. And as those places start to recover, they become home to lots of these herbaceous plants, these colonizing plants and edible plants that, again, sometimes can serve for human forage, sometimes serve as forage for game animals as well. And so Indians are continuing to use these sites after they've abandoned them. Overall, I think what we get is really an anthropogenic landscape, a fancy way of saying human created. People have actually created and influenced and shaped this landscape in the Hudson Valley. They've encouraged really diverse environments, in part because those diverse environments can provide different sorts of resources. And we get what one environmental historian has called a mosaic or patchwork landscape. There's mountains, there's bottomlands, there's uplands, there's wetlands, there's freshwater streams, there's estuary, there's islands. Natives are benefiting from this environmental diversity. They seem to recognize that and actually try to foster the ecological diversity that results. Um, that includes using some places really intensively, uh, some that have been used intensively in the recent past, in the more decent past, some places they only use occasionally, and some they hardly use at all. So this is a dynamic landscape with really a changing configuration. They're moving around, they're using these spaces differently at different times. And so it's not stable, right? It's constantly in flux and being managed. All of this environmental diversity really means that this range of resources are available at different times of the year. And this helps to constitute what we would call an ecological safety net, which protects some of these individual resources from overuse and insulates against disruptions. Because natives are using so many different resources from so many different places, they're not overusing one. And if there happens to be, say, a drought and crops fail, they have backups, right? There are extra fish, there's extra game animals, there's extra edible plants that they haven't fully exploited. Um, and so this can help sort of insulate them from those environmental disruptions, which are more natural. <clears throat> Pausing for just a second as we move into the Dutch arriving. So natives who are managing and maintaining these really complex landscapes are actually fairly easily, I think, uh, incorporating Dutch, the Dutch presence. They're able to fit a minimal Dutch presence, because they're not a ton of colonists early on, into existing environmental relations. Dutch colonists actually seem to recognize this at times. Um, you've got this first quote here on this slide from a colonist who says that there were formerly great numbers of Indian plantations, which now lie waste and vacant. Killian Van Rensselaer says something similar in 1632 when he says that there was cleared land or which has been ceded before by the savages at the water's edge along the river. So clearly both of these authors recognize um, that they are taking advantage of disused native planting grounds. These used to be native inhabitations and farms, uh, and they're positioned well alongside the river, and they can be fairly quickly and easily converted for Dutch use, for Dutch farming. They're already deforested, um, they are, have access to water, they are flat, right, um, and they're at these places where the Dutch actually want to settle. And this is a really important consideration given some of the labor shortages early on in New Netherlands history. 
there just aren't enough settlers to engage in massive landscaping projects. So they're able to take advantage of the fact that natives have done this before, and that really eases colonial settlement. Natives, meanwhile, have moved to areas that serve them better, right? They started to see a decline in fertility in that location. They left it behind, went somewhere new, and the English, or sorry, the Dutch can sort of fill in that gap. What's a little bit more surprising, or was to me uh, when I first started looking at these sources, is that this also seemed to suit natives. Um, I, this is kind of just the most succinct example. I have some others as well. Um, but there's a number of Essipus Sachems in 1658 who are actually complaining to Dutch officials at this moment and saying that they have bestowed the land with the condition that they request and would like to see that it be built upon immediately so that they can be accommodated with everything. They would like to see plowing proceed. And so this just precedes an actual war by about a year, so it's kind of surprising uh, chronologically in that sense, but they are actually requesting European settlement. They want there to be some form of European colonization in this particular location because they see it as a strategic resource zone, right? They want to be accommodated with everything. They see this as something that's unique rather than redundant. They have plenty of forest. They have plenty of meadow. They have plenty of wetlands. What they don't have nearby here is a European settlement. Um, one obvious explanation for why they want it to be there is for trade. Trade, if we're thinking again in those energy terms, really extends the resource base beyond the immediate locale, beyond the Hudson River corridor. And instead, it's funneling energy imports into the valley from further abroad, much further abroad in this case, which really immunizes uh, natives from localized disruptions. Droughts or fires are going to matter less if there's just going to be imports on these Dutch ships that are arriving to supply uh, a European settlement at this location. The other way of understanding this in terms of energy, I think, is that these European settlements can become reservoirs. They have surpluses, they have stores, they have herds, they have farms and fields and warehouses, and those serve essentially as larger versions of storage pits. There's constantly complaints from Dutch colonists and then later on English colonists about raiding. And one of the things that happens if we start looking at when those raids happen, they're not random. They're often during times of environmental stress and natives recognize that Europeans have resources that they can use and so they raid them. So there's a logic to this. As I said earlier, the limited numbers here, I think initially mean that Dutch settlers don't have a huge impact on native subsistence patterns. They slide fairly easy into this really extensive landscape because they're not changing it dramatically, at least not at first. This does, though, mean that they tend to be concentrated near these native communities um, and that that in turn means that eventually their environmental impacts are going to matter for natives who are dependent on these particular locations for native subsistence. As colonists start to spread out, they have a bigger impact and it matters more for natives. And it does generate some tensions and conflicts as the colonists are modifying those landscapes. So the co colonial population obviously continuing to grow, that does mean wider land use needs, more extensive efforts to modify. It means that they have access to labor to actually engage in those modifications. And that's especially the case as they're trying to uh, establish an agricultural base. Um, sometimes the Dutch get positioned as um, really fur traders primarily. Um, if we go back and look at new, uh, the instructions for New Netherland given to the first director, it involves clearing land, surveying, identifying spots for farms. Clearly, agriculture is on the mind of these early colonists and investors as well. And so the Dutch are, of course, engaging in changing that landscape, modifying it to fit their agricultural needs. The English are widening that process, right? They're continuing this, uh, all in support of familiar lifestyles and economic activities and being part of this global um, trade empire and network. By 1664, we're up to around 7,000 to 8,000 settlers, uh, 3,500 or so concentrated around New Amsterdam and Fort Orange, others distributed throughout the valley in these smaller towns and patroonships. And they're engaging in a number of different sort of major um, activities to try to modify the environments they live in. First up, clearing forest. 
Uh, the early instructions, as I said, and promotional literature talk about clearing the forest a lot. They'll talk about forests being in the way of farming. Uh, and a lot of early leases, whether these are, well, often it is tenant farmers who are leasing land from the West India Company, and those leases actually require cleaning. So I had one, or clearing. So I have one example here from 1639, Jonas Brock at Manhattan, who was required to clear uh, and move to a new parcel of company owned land every two years in addition to what he already used. So this is sort of a way of enticing him to farm, but also then helping to develop company owned land um, that will be more useful to the company and subsequent settlers, subsequent colonists as well, to become more valuable in that sense. And this, of course, uh, clearing forests, of course, generally in areas that are adjacent to waterways. This is where the colonial population is spreading. It provides access to transportation. And we'll come back to why some of that forest clearance matters here in a little while. A second major component of this environmental modification is drawing wetlands. There are tons of marshes and swamps and wetlands. Uh, this takes a little bit longer in part because it is really laborious, it's very costly, it takes time and energy, uh, and so colonists kind of put it off. They would rather settle on drier lands, on lands that have already been cleared by natives, as we've already seen. But ultimately drawing wetlands is fairly productive uh, because there are fertile soils at the bottom, there's decaying organic matter, plant life, um, and fairly fertile soil. They're often fairly flat, they're accessible to waterways, and so you can transport goods that are produced there. And a lot of the deeds and land patents that are issued in the early years of Dutch colonization mean that marshes and swamps are claimed, right? They're owned by Europeans by the 1650s and 1660s. Adrian Vanderdonk, who I keep coming back to because his narrative is fantastic and really, really useful, uh, says that there are lands here that could be drained with the aid of levees and plowed. He's clearly anticipating that the land use needs are going to grow and that uh, drawing these wetlands is going to be advantageous at some point. We do have fairly limited examples of extensive drainage projects on the Hudson uh, River. Uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence that this was widespread. Um, we do have a little bit more for the Delaware River, so within this sort of larger New Netherland uh, framework, where there's reports that uh, lands had been drained at a small expense and converted to farming, but also that the expenses for constructing dikes, drainage ditches and sluices, and the cutting of poles run too high. So it's happening, but people aren't necessarily enthusiastic about it because it is really costly. It's not that efficient at this moment. Nonetheless, the English are going to continue to expand on this a little bit. Uh, Francis Lovelace in 1668 uh, is trying to order uh, a public works project in which a sufficient drain whereby the valley may be made dry at Esopus again. Um, and so he's again trying to turn this into a sort of larger governmental project, issue these orders, uh, and argue that it's on the public's behalf rather than something that's going to benefit private individual landowners. Probably more commonly, what we would get during the 17th century is this process of ditching. Dig a ditch around your property. Um, this is in lieu sometimes of a sometimes in lieu of building a fence. This is a way of enclosing property and marking it off, but it also helps to lower the water table because it helps drain that water table and drain soils, improving drainage, and so uh, it doesn't get waterlogged if you choose to plant there. This is a practice that's really well documented by the 1670s, which would suggest it's probably being practiced a little bit earlier. It's certainly not as labor intensive as uh, full-scale drainage projects for entire regions, and so individual property owners might be able to engage in this. A third major component of these environmental uh, environmental modifications involves building mills. Um, as you get a growing population that necessitates construction materials, you need timber. You also need to feed them and there's more and more grain being harvested, processing that into flour uh, to make bread. And so you get this industry of building mills and then of course using them. Mills are often built along these waterways and make, take advantage of dams, usually wing dams, so these things that sort of jut out into the channel. This is not a complete blockage, uh, but it just sort of diverts water into the mill course or the mill runs. Um, and so it's there. That does sometimes start to change those water courses. Again, we can go back to some of the early days of the colony to see some evidence of this. West India Company's instructions in 1625 to the director to note potential mill sites. 
the patroons as well are issuing orders to their agents in the colony uh, to look for places to build grist mills and sawmills. There's enough mill building going on then that by 1664, Maria van Rensselaer is explaining that they're not all that profitable because there are mills everywhere so that there is no specially large amount of grinding. They're all over the place. They're not that useful. We don't need any more. But that, again, suggests that they are going to have an environmental impact because they're fairly widely distributed, especially the timber mills, which sort of claim this land around them that they're going to clear and process. And a fourth component of this uh, landscape modification involves domesticated animals and livestock. Um, again, European colonists are arriving. They recognize that there is a really abundant game population, but these are not the animals that they're accustomed to using, to processing, to tending, and they would they see uh, the sort of abundance of these indigenous creatures as really a sign that the, that uh, they'll be able to support domesticated animals as well. And so they're introducing uh, their own domesticated cows, pigs, sheep uh, as a food source providing meat and dairy, but also a source of traction. These animals can produce labor and power, driving mills, plowing fields, hauling goods, all of that as well. Once again, the West India Company and some of these early instructions are really committed to importing these animals. Uh, a lot of the early lease agreements will indicate that somebody is responsible for a certain number of cows or horses. You also have a series of specially equipped ships between 1624 and 1626 that are outfitted to carry horses, cows, hogs, and sheep to New Netherlands. And by the 1640s, it seems that we do have a self-sustaining population that's fairly healthy um, in the colony. A lot of times these animals are free range. They're not necessarily penned up. Um, and so they're foraging. They're wandering around getting into native fields. Um, they are getting into ecosystems that aren't really adapted to these grazing animals. Cows, for instance, graze really close to the surface. Uh, and so they destroy a lot of these native grasses. They get so close to the roots that those grasses don't regenerate. Um, and so that's something of an issue. And so they're starting to push out some of these native grazing animals like deer, right? There's some habitat destruction happening in this case. And so one of the products of these animals showing up is that they help convert spaces for non-native species um, that are adapted to livestock use. As they wipe out native grasses, you get invasive species coming from European imports, things like clover and crabgrass that work really well and are resilient and can withstand the grazing and herding of uh, this European style animal husbandry. One, or the, the key, I guess, to all of this uh, really is the labor supply. This is important for figuring out how to actually engage in these large scale environmental modifications. There's certainly a growing colonial population, we talked about the numbers being 7,000 to 8,000 by 1664, but enslaved labor also constitutes a substantial labor source, whether it's privately owned or company owned. And there's instances of both. Um, I think what I saw trying to remember now, I think the first uh, documented enslaved Africans arrive in 1626. I know by 1629, you get this policy listed on the slide here that the company will use their endeavors to supply the colonists with as many blacks as they conveniently can. And later on, patroonships are going to be granted 12 slaves to work them. So this is partially a response to the limited uh, recruitment of Dutch settlers. The Dutch economy is in the Netherlands is fairly healthy. They don't feel the need to leave necessarily. There's religious toleration, so they're not pursuing religious liberty in the way that Puritans are in New England. Um, and so there's a struggle to actually recruit people to go to this fairly marginal colony in the Hudson Valley. Uh, and enslaved labor is really important because it enables the colonists to clear land, to build roads, uh, forts, and other structures. It's really crucial to establishing the infrastructure of the colony and the settlement, which makes that colony much more attractive to potential colonists as well. And then, of course, those laborers are moving into these industries. They're harvesting timber, they're working as agricultural labor, and they, this is then really productive work. By 1630, there's about 300 white settlers and about 60 enslaved Africans in the Lower Hudson. By 1654, we get the first um, private traders who are bringing enslaved Africans directly to New Netherland. Often before this, they're being re-exported from other uh, slave colonies like in the West Indies. Um, 
and by six, the 1650s, the estimate is that enslaved Africans make up about 25% of that non-native population uh, in, the, in New Netherlands. So it's a pretty substantial, pretty healthy uh, population. And of course, there's uh, sort of institutions like half freedom um, and that sort of thing. So it gets to be more complicated than just something like plantation slavery. So slave labor really contributing to the infrastructure and the economic production of all of those activities. But all of those activities also let the Dutch assert ownership of land. They can argue that they have developed and improved this land, this landscape as a whole. Um, and that is important in terms of claiming territory against the English, for instance, who are going to argue that the Dutch never actually improved the land. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. All right. All of this does have consequences, right? So you, we still see this when we update and, uh, and modify environments. There's always these unanticipated uh, consequences, sometimes counterproductive consequences, which you get in this point where you have colonists clearing land for agriculture and then discovering that clearing that land instead of agriculture is actually fostering the invasion of weeds. Um, fairly common here. And it's especially disruptive because a lot of these human caused changes really interact with natural phenomena, with natural weather patterns, things like droughts and volcanic eruptions and things like that. So in terms of the consequences, I kind of want to go through three major areas where there are these consequences, starting with the vegetation regime, moving to fauna populations, and then on to waterways. So with that vegetation regime, talking about plants, Europeans are obviously in introducing cultivars, crops on purpose, but the modifications that they're making in clearing, in plowing, in drawing spaces also make space for less desirable species. In particular, weedy species. Um, so by weedy, I don't necessarily mean weeds, which can be something lovely, but go where you don't want them. Weedy species, we're talking about fast growing, really soft tissue plants, grasses, small shrubs, right? These things that thrive in disturbed soils. Uh, we actually talk about these plants sometimes as colonizers uh, because they so quickly arrive in what's overturned soil. So if you plow stuff, say in the fall, in preparation for the winter and for next year, weeds show up and they grow because they're so hardy and they're adapted to that. Um, some of these weed, weedy species then are native, they're just sort of returning to their natural habitats. Some of them are introduced via seed contamination in grain that Europeans are planting, sometimes in animal feed as well. So, for instance, Jeremiah Van Rensselaer in 1668 is complaining that one of these farms uh, in the patroonship, the, the land is so neglected and moreover so full of weeds that one hardly knows where to get seed grain. I'm not even sure where to go for um, to, to get the seeds for next year's crops. And we can confirm that there is a vegetation regime change by looking at pollen levels and sediment samples. It's pretty clear uh, that weedy species increase and tree populations decline. We also have changes to fauna populations, to animals. European livestock are, of course, spreading out. They're inflicting crop damage. They're digging up storage pits of natives, and natives are responding to that. They're retaliating by killing animals that damage their resources and invade their fields. They also seem to see some of these European livestock as substitutes for the game populations that are decreasing. And so they'll hunt some of these domesticated animals as well. And colonists often interpret this as property violence violations. Indians are invading their lands, they're attacking their possessions and their animals. And so you see this popping up a lot in mid-century peace treaties trying to address this. Waterways, also affected by all of this. There's always been ice flows, tidal surges, and floods, but you get more of these floods, uh, it seems to colonists at least. They talk about these floods documented in 1639, 1643, 1661, and 1663, 1666, 1683. You get the idea. They're constantly talking about flooding, and the flooding is overflowing grain. It's killing livestock. And there is this perception on the part of colonists that it's actually growing worse. Um, that and that may actually be accurate because these envir environmental modifications are contributing factors. They're producing erosion. Drainage ditches are filling up with refuse and backing up. 
settlement patterns in the timber industry, clear banks, they loosen up soils that erode into waterways, and we see increased inorganic part, uh, particles in sediment layers. We know that there is erosion happening. Drying, also a problem because sometimes sediment deposits from erosion are raising wetland elevations. You get draining and ditching. Wetlands are important. They absorb excess water flow during these seasonal floods, and that's no longer the case because they're not there to act as a sponge. That water goes down the channel or it overflows those banks. That's especially the case because shorelines are being hardened. You get walls, dikes, and bankments to try to protect human construction, but that means less room for streams to actually expand. You have mills and dams that can change water courses as well. So this may explain why you do actually get floods in sort of surprising years, including extended drought years. There's less overall precipitation, but the landscape can't really absorb um, all of that water flow. And so tree ring data indicates six major floods across 1632 to 1700. And some of those floods are, are some of those droughts, sorry, are happening in years uh, where there is a lot of flooding actually reported. So it's not so much uh, that these changes cover the entire Hudson Valley by the end of the 17th century or that there's no resources left, right? This is not necessarily that widespread. But the environmental changes are really localized around the focal point of European settlement. They're happening at the nexus of all of these rich energy reservoirs and energy flows that Indians strategically inhabit. And so natives are being displaced from these locations at the same time as their subsistence patterns are really being disrupted because of these environmental changes. Invasive plant species and grazing livestock are changing the vegetation regime, including edible wild plants, makes it harder for Indians to eat. Uh, that affects game populations, which also diminishes food sources. Erosion changes water quality and water flow water temperature, spawning grounds, and so that affects fish populations and these fish migrations. Drawing wetlands discourages migratory waterfowl, and the European property regime, of course, is inhibiting Indian access to these most productive or pivotal areas. As Europeans are sort of expanding and claiming this as private property, they're excluding natives from that usage um, and sort of disrupting, again, this ability to move around the landscape to use these different resources at all those times. So all of this means that we get the simplification of the landscape. Um, there's fewer ecological niches. There's no ecological safety net yet left. Net left. Uh, natives can't just turn and intensify the use of one resource because another has diminished. And so all of these native investments in creating this really rich and complex mosaic uh, landscape have essentially evaporated. Then they become much more dependent on a narrower set of landscapes and produ uh, production. This contributes, it seems like, uh, to Kipp's War, 1643 to 1645, when uh, Governor Kift is exact, trying to exact a grain tribute uh, to pay for the defense of the colony as well as neighboring Indians. Uh, there are complaints at the same time about wandering livestock. There's a drought in 1644 and 1645, which probably produces uh, crop failures, which would contribute to uh, some stresses if you're trying to produce extra for a grain tribute. There's also some volcanic activity in the 1640s that decreases global temperatures and sunlight. And so we see this conflict, right? Uh, it's probably exacerbated by some of these environmental stresses. The Esopus Wars in 1659 to 1664, similar pattern of colonial expansion livestock invasion, a drought from 1661 to 1670, uh, 1667, and more of this volcanic activity as well. Elizabeth, I have like two sections left. Am I okay or should I wrap it up? Oh, good. no, keep going. You're good. Okay. We are almost done. Um, so you get a sense of a lot of these major changes, I hope at least, uh, and how that affects native populations. That doesn't necessarily mitigate what the English are going to claim is the instability of this Dutch regime. Um, the English show up in 1664, obviously, take over this colony, and they make the arguments that, the, um, that this is kind of an unstable, undeveloped colony. And you get really contrasting interpretations. Uh, Jacob Steenum is a Dutch poet uh, in the 1650s who writes this first uh, little set of verses I've got here. That new Netherland, thou noblest spot of earth, where bounteous heaven ever poureth forth the fullness of his gifts of greatest worth, mankind to nourish. Wherever men a helping hand accord to nature there behold, the fields reward them. 
So if you parse this and dig through it, he basically is saying New Netherland is wonderful. And when people farm and contribute their own work, it gets even better and they're rewarded, right? He sees a thriving colony. Daniel Denton in 1670, so a few years after the English have arrived, uh, and he's English, of course, writes that some may admire that these great and rich tracts of land should be no better inhabited whilst it was under Dutch government. But since the reducement of it, there are several towns of a considerable greatness begun and settled by people out of New England, and every day more and more come to view and settle. So Denton, other English colonists are claiming that uh, the New Netherland colony was characterized by a small population, poor harvests, a reliance on trade, it was subject to pressures from Indians, and that all of those factors really undermined Dutch claims and showed how little impact the Dutch had made and that they never really permanently settled or engaged in any sort of landscape improvement. They'd only been there as impermanent fur traders. This is sort of an extension of what a lot of European colonists would claim about Native Americans, that they inhabited a natural environment, that they lived off nature's bounty, lived off the land, that they didn't labor and produce and manage that landscape, and in that both of those cases, this justified territorial conquest. It argued that the people who actually lived there had done nothing to claim that land and make it their own. In this case, um, I think that uh, both those the English claims both about the Dutch and about Native Americans are really exaggerated, right? They ignore really considerable human labor, which we've talked about. They ignore how productive this landscape is, including agriculturally. Um, New Netherland does export grain at various times to Boston. Uh, and so clearly um, they are producing a surplus. Ignore really sizable populations that are continuing to grow across this era. And so these are really rhetorical claims that suggest that the English are the ones who initiate a sustained period of improvement. This is an attempt to really secure their territorial claims. Uh, really, I think it's much, there's much more continuity in terms of how colonists are using and transforming that landscape uh, rather than a clear line of demarcation happening at 1664, right? So to wrap up, um, I began with a group of Mohicans in 1675 who were linking these environmental conditions to their diminished health and strength. And I'd like to conclude with a group of Muncie and Mohican Indians who show up at Schenectady in 1705. And they're explaining that they're migrating west. They're leaving the Hudson Valley because we are become a small nation, the flesh taken from our bodies. What they're indicating here is that that anthropogenic landscape, that human landscape that their ancestors had constructed and that a century earlier had supported a really thriving native population no longer exists. It's not capable of supporting them in the same way. That century had seen really dramatic environmental changes, maybe not spread across the entire valley, but really focused in the most productive, biologically rich centers where these energy streams characterizing the native Hudson Valley converged together. Other Hudson Valley Indians did find ways to reconstitute ties to the landscape and occupy niches within that new anthropogenic landscape. They start working for European colonists. They move into upland areas and occupy these formerly specialized sites. But this group's departure, I think, really marks the culmination of a century of colonialism that physically displaced Native peoples, but also disrupted the environmental relations that had long sustained them. Thank you. Great, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I know I saw that we have at least one question in the chat um, and I'd like to invite other people who have questions to also um, either place them in the chat or you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, I'm gonna read this one, I believe from Barbara Sweet. Um, she asks, if you know, when did fruits come to the Hudson Valley uh, as New York was once the state that produced the most apples? So I don't know about all fruits. Um, certainly there are orchards by the 1650s. I think fairly early on on these company farms, there's sort of a strategic plan to plant grain in some places, fruit orchards in some. Um, I would have to go back and look and I don't know off the top of my head, but I know by 1655, we get the peach wolf, right? Um, which is called that because there are native, uh, there's, I think there's a native woman who's harvesting peaches from uh, an orchard, upsets a colonist and it sort of escalates from there. Um, 
So clearly there is some cultivation by the 1650s. Apples in particular, I'm not quite sure. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you. I would point out, uh, if you look at the Poughkeepsie Journal from the early 1780s, you can see some great variety of species of apples, um, but that's, you know, much later than this period, so I'm unfamiliar with the 17th century. Um, okay, would anybody else like to, ah, here we go, we have one from John Vincent. Um, when did Lake Albany break to the Atlantic? Mm, that's interesting. A long time ago. Yeah. Um, actually, I can call something up real quick and see. I think I've got it here. Um, it's in a different document rather than what I wrote, but. Oops. Okay, I don't have it specifically, um, but it says what I've got here. And this is a chapter draft from something else. Um, scientists believe it began its slow retreat 18,000 years ago. Terminal moraines impeded river drainage. Water is instead collecting to a series of large lakes in the Hudson Valley, most notably the pro, pro glacial Lake Albany. Um, sorry, my alarm going off there. Um, so that is in place by 18,000 years ago. And then you have Rockwell Highlands. All right, so within the last 18,000 years, I would say, I don't know exactly based on that. Um, there is, I think it is a section of, well, I was gonna refer you to something, but now I can't remember exactly which, where it is. There's an essay by a guy named Strayer who talks about history on the Hudson River. I mean, I think it may be in there that I'm pulling that okay. from. Okay, thank you. Um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, they they can feel free to ask a question that way. Um, I, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned a lot of different source material, which, you know, as an environmental historian, you get to play with dendrochronology and, and um, archaeology. And I'm just curious if you have a, a favorite particular type of source material or specific source that you refer to a lot in your work. Sort of. Um, so one of the tricky things with a lot of that scientific data and the dendrochronology and the sediment samples is historians are really reliant on um, scientists to figure out what the heck that means. Um, and we have to go sort of read these scientific papers because we can't like, there are a few of us I'm sure who can look at the data and do something with it. That's not me. Um, what I do find really fascinating, and I use this all the time in class, is the North American Drought Atlas. Uh, which is a reconstruction of these dendrochronological records for all of North America over, I think, a, at least a thousand years, because I know I sort of go through the colonial era and you get the sort of heat map of precipitation um, as you do that. So that's a great place to go and see kind of um, some sort of uh, synthesized version of the data, right? It's actually in one place. Neat. Um, hang on, let me see if there are any other questions in the chat. There's nothing else in the chat. Okay, gotcha. Okay, um, so if anyone if I has any other questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, otherwise, um, thank you so much for the presentation tonight. Uh, it was really informative and we will be posting it on our website um, so people can rewatch it. Um, and I will send out that link on our social media channel uh, tomorrow. Um, so thank you to everybody who came tonight uh, and I hope you have a good night and thank you again, uh, Dr. Sellers. Thank you everybody and thank you, Elizabeth. Great, take care.